All right, so here we go. Woo, it's the last lecture. Um, so this is it for uh, April 21st. If you look at the schedule then, um, this is for Tuesday, April 21st. On Thursday, April 23rd then, um, is so it's sort of a review time. Um, I'll have office hours uh, here on Zoom from 2 to 3.15, then my normal office hours from 3.30 to 4.30. If you want to stop by, ask any last minute questions before the exam, anything like that, um, I'll be here. And also then don't forget on Thursday then, uh, your last homework's due. It's a bit longer than the others just because there's a lot to, uh, lot to cover, but I don't think it should have been terribly difficult for you. So um, we've got that on Thursday, the uh, the. 23rd. And then, of course, on Tuesday, uh, a week from today, then on the 28th, is exam number three. Um, it's going to co cover the material then from chapters 17, 18, and 19 then. So about the Milky Way, um, other galaxies, and a little bit today we're going to talk about then um, from chapter 19 with cosmology. And looking through that, I know a long time ago I promised the number of equations that we see drops off as we go throughout this semester, and that's certainly the case here. There are really only two equations that we've talked about in those last three chapters. One is the equation then for the luminosity of a Cepheid variable star, one of those pulsating variable stars, uh, which is how Hubble then found the distance to the uh, to the Andromeda galaxy. Um, we've got that. You combine that then with the distance modulus equation, how the difference between absolute and apparent magnitudes can get you the distance. That's from uh, that's from a long time ago. Um, and you can get then the, the distance to uh, to a cluster of stars, or at least to, to a variable star that way. Um, so we've got that equation, and then of course the, the other equation we've got for this test then is, uh, is Hubble's Law. And I'll make a little sheet then that you can print out or have with you then um, for the exam that's got those couple of equations that you're going to need. And of course then that's sort of it. Um, we've got our final then, which is Tuesday, May 5th. It'll be from uh, 11 o'clock to, uh, to 1.30 and it'll be just like uh, the other exams then. Um, it'll basically just be on as you learn and go take the exam. And for this next exam and for the final, I think we've got the kinks worked out um, from with what happened with exam number two. So you should, you'll be able to go back and change answers and stuff um, on these next two exams uh, before you submit. But more about the final then when we get a little bit closer to it right now then. Um, let's just worry about exam number three. And actually, um, speaking of that, I realized um, when I, I, I did this on the last chapter too, um, when we finished then chapter 18 um, uh, on the last lecture, I forgot to ask you questions. So here you go. These are some questions. You might find something like this on the test. These are from previous exams that I've given um, about stuff related to, to other galaxies. And so the first question, I know you can read, um, but it sort of helps me if I read them too. Um, which of the following is most true? And so you've got four choices there. Elliptical galaxies slowly evolve into spirals. They flatten as they collapse and the rotation causes the arms to form. Uh, spiral galaxies contain no old stars, therefore they cannot evolve from ellipticals. Um, and another choice then is some difference between uh, spirals and ellipticals must arise because of environment, most likely through interactions. And of course, your fourth choice is the classification scheme for galaxies represents an evolutionary sequence. And that's, uh, you know, Hubble's tuning fork. And right away, if you remember, uh, I said it a couple times when we talked about the tuning fork then, that it's not an evolutionary sequence. And so, boom, right away, you know, D isn't true. And I'm hoping in the back of your head, you're also thinking B isn't true. Spiral galaxies contain no old stars. Remember our, the halo of our Milky Way then? It's full of those old population two stars. I mean, so no, no, spirals do contain uh, old, uh, old stars, but they also contain young stars. And it's those O and B stars and that light up the spiral arms. But there are lots of low mass stars and old stars and stuff in the spirals too. Um, and ellipticals then slowly evolving into spirals. How is that going to happen? Because ellipticals start off with no dust and gas to begin with. So how are they ever going to form uh, new stars? And so A can't be true either. And yeah, I'm looking for the answer C. And we talked about this idea of looking 
looking at the, the, you know, the, the really large clusters of galaxies, the rich galaxy clusters, and how they're mostly ellipticals. And then when you look at the poor galaxy clusters and like our local group and isolated uh, galaxies, you tend to find a much, much higher population of spirals. And so something with what kind of galaxy you're getting has something to do with the environment those galaxies are living in. Is it a rich cluster? Is it a poor cluster? Uh, boom. So some of the difference in between these galaxies has to arrive um, uh, from their environment and, and through interaction. All right, so uh, another question on what property is common to all spiral galaxies. And so your choices are ongoing star formation, a disk, a bulge, and a halo, probably uh, lots of dark matter, and then C, abundant interstellar dust and gas in the disk, and then D, all of the above. All right, so I sort of, I guess I sort of telegraphed this one because I already talked about how spiral galaxies really stand out because of the young O and B stars in their spiral arms. And so that's sort of giving you this idea of A, uh, and um, well, in order to form stars, you need you need dust and gas. That's what stars form out of. So probably C. And the minute you get two of them, you know it's got to be all of the above. But I also talked about our galaxy having uh, you know this this halo, and yeah, it's got a disk and a bulge. So it's also B. Yeah, the answer then is all of the above. Yay! Um, the most uh, accepted interpretation of Hubble's law. Again, these are sort of softballs here. Uh, the Milky Way is at the center of the universe and all other galaxies appear to be flying away from us because of the Big Bang. Uh, the universe, the distances between galaxies must be expanding. Strong gravitational fields of galaxies cause their light to be redshifted, which makes them look like they're moving away from us. And the Milky Way and the galaxies near us are all moving away from the other galaxies. Uh, all right, so... Um, Again, you know, one way to approach these is either you know the answer right away and you go, yeah, yeah, okay, I know which one of these it is. Um, and sometimes when I used to take these tests and I would like cover up the different choices and see if I could think of the, the answer. And then when I thought I had the answer, I'd look at the choices and if they matched, I'd go with that. Um, but, but clearly, um, we've talked about this already. The Milky Way is not the center of the universe. Um, we've had a long history of bad luck whenever we've thought we were at the center of er er anything. So no, um, strong gravitational fields of galaxies causes their light to be redshifted, which makes them look like they're moving away from us. That's one of those that kind of, I mean, yeah, gravitational fields can cause gravitational redshifts, but you're talking like neutron star kind of gra nah, probably not that. Um, they, nah, the gravitational fields aren't like the gravitational field of a neutron star close to the neutron star. Yes, they have a lot of mass, but it's galaxies that spread out over a, a large area. And yeah, you can get gravitational lensing, but gravitational redshifting is hard. That, we never talked about it uh, in the case of galaxies and gravitational redshifts. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna eliminate C then too. Um, and the Milky Way and the galaxies near us are all moving away from all the other galaxies, and that's true. But that's not what Hubble's law is. Remember, Hubble's law says the further away a galaxy is, the bigger its um, recession velocity, or the faster it's moving away from us. And so, well, D is true. Uh, it's not really telling us anything about Hubble's law. I'm looking for B. You know I'm looking for B, right? That the universe is expanding, and that's how we interpret then Hubble's law. Um, that a galaxy appears reddish-yellow in color, assuming there's no interstellar reddening um, uh, dust, and after taking into account the effect of any redshift, this would suggest. So you're looking at, at a galaxy here that's just yellowish-red, kind of like an elliptical galaxy. We talked about that. Um, and, you know, we're not worrying about the fact that maybe reddening made it look too red because there's dust, or maybe it looks too red because it's moving away from us. And that, that bit in parentheses, and I'm telling you to ignore all of that stuff and just think really simple. I've got a population then of yellowish red stars. What can I, what can I figure out from that? And so your choices are, um, there are very few young stars, there are very few old stars, um, there aren't many heavy elements, or that a recent episode of star formations taken place. And again, hopefully this doesn't take too much thought then, because you go, oh, if I've got young stars in there, I'll have O and B stars, so those are going to be blue and white. It's not going to look like a bunch of yellow stars. Um, likewise, then, um, a recent episode of star formation. That's what makes the spiral arms stand out in spiral galaxies with the beautiful blue light from those, those massive young stars that form with star formation. So it's not A and D. You might think about C, um, 
but we've never really talked. And this is one of those other tricks. If, if you've listened to the lectures, you've been to the lectures, you've read the book, um, you've thought about this stuff. And if it's news to you, I'm lying. And so no matter how good it sounds, um, if we haven't talked about it, it's lying. And that's why you want to go to all the lectures. And that's why you want to read the book then so you, you recognize those. And so um, C then, we've never talked about how um, the presence of heavy elements affects the light from stars. And, and technically, if you want to, you know, so I do this sort of stuff for a living, and if anything, then um, heavy elements tends to make the stars look redder because you get a little extra absorption um, in the blue part of the spectrum from the iron and titanium. Um, but eh, it's a distraction. You want to go with B then. Oh, sorry, A. You've got very, very few young stars there. It's a population of old stars, and so all the high-mass stars have died away, and you've just got low-mass stars, which are much cooler, and so, yeah, it's just going to appear yellow uh, or red then um, when you're looking then at the light from that. Uh, um, all right, so uh, you observe a galaxy moving away from you at 7,000 kilometers per second. How far away is it? And this is a Hubble's Law type problem where you've got the velocity is equal then to the Hubble constant times the distance. And here, though, I'm giving you the velocity and I'm giving you the Hubble's constant. You need to solve for the distance. So you've got V is equal to H times D. Well, I want to get the D, so I divide both sides by H, and I get distance then is equal to the velocity divided by the Hubble constant. And sure enough, then, 7,000 kilometers per second divided by 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. That gets you then, oh, excellent, this is all messed up. Um, the units on these should not be millions of light years. They should be millions of parsecs. Oh, man. okay. So I, I, that, that won't happen on the test, I promise. Um, all right, forgive the edit, but I could not let that stand. Um, so the problem is I've given you the velocity uh, that we see a galaxy moving away from us. I've given you then Hubble's constant. What's the distance? Well, you've got velocity is equal to Hubble's constant times distance. And so you need to solve for the distance, divide both sides by h, and so you've got the distance then, it's just the velocity divided by Hubble's constant, or in this case then, 7,000 kilometers per second, divided by 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. If you just follow the units then, that works out, the kilometers per second all cancel each other, and you're left with 1 over, one over megaparsecs, uh, uh, and, and sure enough then, you know, 7,000 divided by 70, it's 100. And notice, so the other two, the other choices then, uh, four, 490,000, that's H times D, and 0 0.01, that's actually H divided by D, so any possible combination of 7,000 and 70 that you would do with your calculator um, is one of those choices. So, uh, again, just because it's multiple choice doesn't mean it's easy. But that one should have been pretty straightforward. Um, all right, so, okay, what we're going to talk about next then, the last sort of thing then um, in this, in this uh, heck, this whole course then, um, is the whole idea of cosmology. And, um... Well, I, don't know. I like to always like to start this with a with a sort of a story here. It's a stupid story, but um, when I was much younger, this was in the seventh grade, um, we had uh, somebody come by from the the neighboring technical college to talk about then courses that that were available to us uh, through the technical college, and and I sat through the presentation and saw and and noticed then that they actually had like uh, courses in cosmology, and I was like, oh, this is fabulous, and this is, it makes sense. It's a technical college; they would have cosmology courses. That's fabulous, and so I remember. I remember going to my guidance counselor and going, no, 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 I want to transfer to the to the technical college so I can uh, so I can take cosmology. And and they were like, oh, are you sure about that? And I said, ah, study of the universe, this is great, I really want to do that. And they were like, yeah, but, but it's actually cosmetology then. And so this is about makeup and hair design, and are you sure? I was like, oh, oh. Um, so they're, don't confuse the two. Um, so cosmology then is really sort of the study of the universe, uh, how it came to be, its structure, its evolution, all of that. It's a, it's a fascinating thing 
to get into. Um, although like relativity in some of these other areas, and it's one of those where if you think too hard about it, uh, you're going to end up staring at the ceiling all night and not getting any, any sleep. But I mean, if you, if you just look around, um, all the stuff that you see is made out of matter. And that matter has been here since the beginning of the universe. Um, so everything you see around you, look at your hand, your, the matter that makes up your hand is like 13.8 billion years old. Yes, it's uh, a little bit different than when it first started out. Most of what you're seeing then around you has been through the core of at least one star um, and ejected, or maybe the outer outer shells um, uh, of a star then, and ejected back out into space. And now you and the stuff around you then is formed from that material that was transformed from hydrogen and helium then into heavier and heavier elements as stars formed and died in the universe. Um, but it's it's a really, really interesting idea. And and you can think though about you know how did all this happen? What what what's going on with this whole universe thing? And so cosmology then, the study of the structure and evolution of, of the universe. And and so um really to start out getting your head around this idea, um, you actually have to make a couple of, uh, of assumptions then in cosmology. And these, these go back um, actually sort of to, to Martin Friedman and even a little bit bef before him then in the early 1900s. Um, but the idea then, um, these assumptions then, is that the universe is homogeneous and that the matter is evenly spread through the universe. And that's a weird assumption to make because I sit here and I look and I go, well, what's going on right here? The matter right here is a little bit different from the matter like one foot to my left. Um, or the, you know, I see this whole planet Earth thing here, and if I go, you know, two million miles that way, I've got empty space. That's not very homogeneous. Or I look at our solar system, and it's mostly empty space, except I've got these planets and this star at the center. Or I can think about our Milky Way galaxy, and we've got a whole bunch, few hundred billion stars right here. I just look a little bit off to the side, though, and there's nothing. That's not very homogeneous. Um, and, and the trick to that, though, is the assumption is that if you look on a large enough scale, um, the universe looks homogeneous. If you go back, and I should have had the wits to bring uh, to, to, to put this slide back in the, in the rotation, that if you go back and look at those pictures um, from the last chapter of the large scale structure of the universe, the idea of the filaments and voids, um, if I take a big enough box, um, it's pretty, that's, that's pretty uniform then. Um, you know, this mixture of galaxies and voids, that's actually pretty homogenous. The trick is to take a big enough box um, and on those sorts of scales and boxes then that are millions of light years across then, the universe actually is pretty homogenous then. And this idea then also that the universe is isotropic. And so the idea of homogenous then is that the matter itself is spread sort of uniformly through the universe. There's not one spot in the universe where all the stuff is over in this corner and there's nothing else out here on a large enough scale. And the idea that the universe is isotropic then means it looks the same in every direction, pretty much the same. And so on large scales, if you're sitting on this get one of these galaxies and then you look out in that direction, you sort of see just as many galaxies as you look in that direction, as you look in that direction, as you look in that direction. And the universe looks the same in every direction. And yes, you've got to look on tremendous scales, but if you do on these sort of cosmological universe scales of millions of light years, then yeah, you pretty much see the same number of galaxies then, um, in every direction. Another really good example of an isotropic um, sort of situation, you think about Hubble's law, no matter what direction I look, I see galaxies moving away from us. The further away they are, the faster they're moving away. And Hubble's constant is the same in this direction as it is in this direction as it is in this direction. So it's all isotropic. And the reason we make these sort of assumptions then is if you don't, if you say the universe is not homogeneous, if there's a corner here where you got a whole bunch of stuff and nothing over here in this part of the universe, again, on these super large scales, it means this part of the universe is different from this part of the universe. Or if you say the universe isn't isotropic, the universe looks different in this direction versus this direction, there's something special about where you are because you're getting different views in different directions. Or there's something different about the universe in this direction 
as opposed to the universe in this direction. What these are really saying then is that the universe is the same everywhere. There's no special place in the universe where things are going to look different than any other place if you look on a big enough scale. And this gets down then to the cosmological principle um, that we do not occupy a special place in the universe, a special position in the universe. And finally then, after all these millennia of we're at the center, we're at the center, we're at the center, finally just like, no, we're not at the center. We don't occupy a special position in the universe. And broader, bigger than that, then there is no special position in the universe. All observers in the universe see the same thing going on, no matter where they are, no matter what direction they look. All right. <clears throat> and so those are sort of the, the starting assumptions. And, and, and so also, I mean, another thing, another idea then is the, the, of the universe having a beginning. Um, and we saw a little bit about this um, when we talked about, if you do the lab, um, I'm sure you're doing the lab. What am I saying? Of course you're doing the lab. I talk about this in, in the lab um, with this idea of back in the sort of the, the 1800s, even a little bit before that then, this idea that the universe was infinitely old and static and filled with stars, going almost sort of back to like Herschel's idea, what Herschel saw with that grindstone model of the Milky Way, that was the universe itself. And that this universe then, it's been there here forever, it's infinitely old, and it sort of stretches on infinitely far in every direction. It's just always been here, unchanging, full of stars. Um, and in the lab, I'll talk a little bit about the idea of Einstein um, developing general relativity and the equations then for, that govern then general relativity, which describe how mass and gravity and the universe, the fabric of space and time itself, and all interact with each other. And he had this problem, though, where, where you figure out how all this stuff works, and the minute you say, well, there's mass in the universe, with that mass comes gravity, which is going to start pulling the universe together, because gravity attracts. He was like, oh, wait, no, 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 we can't have that. The universe is infinitely old, it's static and unchanging. So Einstein put sort of a repulsive springiness of space into, into his equations. And mathematically, he did that through something with, that we just referred to then as the cosmological constant, where it's a springiness in space then that pushes back against the gravity. And he did this then all to maintain this idea of an infinitely old static universe. Um, but there's a problem with that. And this is referred to then as Obler's paradox. It had been around um, a little bit before this, but um, it was Heinrich Olberg, Ol Olbers then um, in 1926 um, who argued, though, that if the universe is infinitely big, if it's infinitely old and static full of stars, the night sky should be bright. And his idea then was if we're sitting here and we look out in the night sky, at any direction we look, we should run into a star. And so if there's a star in every direction we look, because, you know, it's, inf it's infinitely old, the lights from those stars have been coming to us forever, and there's infinite stars in every direction, it's a lot like, you know, being in a forest here, there we go, and, and taking a look through the forest. Every line of sight then um, runs into a tree when you're in this forest. And the same sort of idea with us, surrounded then by an infinite number of stars that have been here infinitely not as long, every line of sight um, points to a star, and so... Um, the night sky should be as bright as the surface of a star. And um, that, that's an interesting idea. And you can say, well, okay, but now we know there's clouds of dust out there that'll block the starlight. But if you think about that cloud of dust, then it's got starlight shining on it then for an infinite amount of time from every direction from all of these stars. That's going to heat the dust cloud up. Dust cloud's going to start glowing. It's going to get as hot as a star. It's going to glow as much as a star does. Ah. Uh, and, and that, that was an interesting sort of problem then. And it, it wasn't until like almost 20 years later then um, that, that someone sort of suggested a solution to it. And, and oddly enough, it was uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, and this was in his poem then, uh, 1848, uh, called Eureka. And um, if you're a fan of American literature, 
I don't eh, Eureka is an interesting read. Maybe I'll leave it at that. If you're if you're interested in such things, uh, come see me in my office hours. We can talk about what a wacky piece of work um, Eureka was. It was one of Poe's or one of Poe's sort of last things that he did. Anyways, in it though, he suggests this idea, this solution to it. Then um, was uh, that well, maybe the universe isn't infinitely old. Maybe the universe had a beginning. And so even though the universe might be infinite in extent, if the universe had a beginning, those super, super distant stars, there hasn't been time enough for the light from those stars um, to reach us. So the very, very distant stars, that light hasn't gotten to us yet. And so that's why we see um, the, the night sky as dark. And, and it's an interesting idea, but um, yeah. As near as we can tell, the universe indeed had a beginning. And, and since, since this idea, you know, since the beginning of the idea of a beginning, um, we've been trying to figure out then, you know, what the age of the universe is. And you can think about different ways to do this. Um, one idea is to, to try and find the most distant objects you can and to figure out then how far away they are. And if you know how fast light travels, well, you can say, oh, that thing's, you know, uh, 100 miles from me. Light travels at 50 miles an hour. Oh, it took you know, two hours for that light to get me. That's how old the universe was. That's one way to do it. Um, and, and I'll get back to that in a second. Other ways of doing it um, would be to look at objects like star clusters, those globular clusters, figure out then the ages of the stars that are just starting to die in them, use that then to figure out, well, what mass do those stars have? How long does it take those stars to run out of fuel? This was one of the first sort of clues that the universe was about 13 billion years old because it turns out those globular clusters in the halo of our galaxy are some of the oldest objects um, we can get distances for. But another way to do it though um, is to try and find then the oldest objects, the, sorry, the most distant objects we can see and determine how far they are away they are and this idea then of the distance ladder. Remember we uh, you sort of look at how things are moving around and maybe sort of proper motions and parallax to figure out the distances to nearby objects. A few of those objects might be um, uh, Cepheid variables or other types of variable stars. Well, once we use those Cepheid variables, we can use those then to get out get the distances to nearby galaxies. Once we've got the distances to nearby galaxies, we can start looking at the, if it's a spiral, uh, the, the brightness of the brightest stars or the biggest globular, most luminous globular clusters or the sizes of H2 regions and to calibrate all of these things and to go out further and further and further. Or even, you know, if you're lucky and see a type 1a supernova in one of these things, maybe use that to get the distance to it. Anyways, to find these objects and figure out how far away they are, use the speed and use the speed of light to figure out then, well, how long did it take that light to get to us then? And this idea then that time, it's just distance divided by velocity. If you travel 60 miles an hour at 30 miles or 60 miles at 30 miles an hour, you know that trip uh, trip took uh, took two hours. And so it's this idea of the look back time, which is always something um, fun to think about in astronomy, this, this idea that it takes light a finite time um, to reach us. And I, I, you know, when I go out observing sometimes to one of the big telescopes out on the, out on the coast or something like that, um, sitting in the plane going, oh yeah, okay, the light uh, that I'm going to see tonight then, uh, it's just, uh, just passing Pluto. Um, and, and this idea that you know, you're looking at this object that's 2,000 light years away, the light that's reaching you then, uh, it started its voyage um, 2,000 years ago. And you're looking at light then that's 2,000 years old from this object then that's 2,000 um, light years away. And so this idea though of a, of a look back time, and yeah, here we go. So the light only travels at a finite speed, uh, um, three times 10 to the eighth uh, meters per second. And so that's, that's one way to figure it out. Um, and it works well for objects that are nearby, but it becomes more, I mean, because it seems straightforward, but it actually becomes uh, more complicated than when we're talking about objects and that are, that are 
well, at cosmological distance. When we're talking about objects that, that are so far away, we have to worry then about the expansion of the universe. And because, you know, going back to this idea of Hubble's law, then we see these galaxies moving away from us then, and the further away they are, the faster they're moving away from us, because the space between them then um, is expanding. And, and thinking about then that sort of raisin bread model, and I'll, I'll talk about a couple other models in a few minutes, um, where... Um, where you've got then uh, the galaxies are raisins and a piece of bread. You put it in the oven, the bread expands, and all the raisins end up moving away from each other. Um, and they go, oh, look, you know, it's a Hubble-type expansion thing. Um, and some sort of a model like that then, where the space then, the distances between the raisins, the distances between the galaxies, is increasing with time. And we know, though, that there's this relationship then between how far away the galaxy is, the distance d, Hubble's constant, which is the slope of that distance, distance versus velocity line, and then the redshift velocity or the redshift velocity, that VR, the velocity of recession, we know that relationship just given to us by Hubble's law. And yeah, so um, things that are very far away from us are moving away from us then very, very quickly. So we have a situation then where light is emitted from a distant object, and that light then travels to us and you so, say, okay, you know, here's this distant galaxy. Here we are. Oh, there's the light then on its way to us from the, from the object then um, that was very, 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 very far away. But the problem is um, uh, the universe then um, is actually expanding at the same time. And so the universe, so you figure, oh, um, this, you know, the light's then taking us this far. Uh, you know, I'm trying to not use numbers. But yeah, the light's taking us then, um, 13 billion years to reach us from this object. In that 13 billion years, though, um, the universe has actually expanded. And so that, that gets a little bit tricky then. And, and we talk about, though, this idea of the observable universe. And you, so you can go outside then and look and you look at the things in that we can observe then here on Earth. And, and um, so, oh gosh, what to say about this? Um, the sort of scales on here, these little ticks then here that you can probably barely see, each of these is a billion light years. These bigger ticks on the bottom then, each of these is a billion parsecs. Um, and so for us here uh, in the sort of the, the Virgo supercluster, which includes the local group, which includes the Milky Way, which includes the sun, is small, smaller than a pixel here. Um, this is sort of the edge of our observable universe then. And you say, okay, well, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Um, that means the, the radius of our observable bubble then should be 13.8 a uh, uh, billion light years, right? The universe is 13.8 billion years old. Uh, so the light then that's just reaching us here from the edge of the universe, or 13.8 uh, billion light years away then, should just be reaching us. The trouble is the light then that's just just reaching us then from this, this observable edge, it's moved. And, and in that 13.8 billion years it's taken to reach us then, the, the universe itself has actually expanded. And so when we take that expansion into account, what you see from objects then that are very, very, very far away at the, the sort of limit of what we can see our observable unit, universe then, it's actually about 46 billion light years um, that we can see. And, and so this idea then, um, we look out, we see all these, these uh, galaxies and stuff, and, and here you can see then um, it's a pretty homogeneous distribution. And I just want to mention that again, this idea that the universe is homogeneous and on very, very, very large scales. So here we go then, this, each of these takes us a billion light years. And yeah, universe pretty, uh, pretty homogeneous here. And it also then sort of looks the same then um, in every possible direction. And it looks then like we're at the center of this distribution of galaxies, this the universe, and it looks like we're at the center um, of, of this observable universe. And um, you can ask yourself, though, well, what if we had um, some alien species here, then maybe just on the edge of um, our observable universe, what would somebody here look like? And so the idea, though, is if somebody's like right here, they would have an observable universe then, and I think this is actually in your homework, an observable universe then that's a sphere then just pretty much the same size as our observable universe, and it's going to include some of our, you know, it's going to include, you know, if the 
the, the aliens are sitting right here, their view of the observable universe is going to include some of our observable universe and maybe even us out at the edge, but their observable universe is also going to include some stuff that we can't see because it's too far away. And the light from this stuff then out here, um, it hasn't reached us. But what they should see should look just like what we see just on sort of, you know, average generic sort of, you know, it's the same sort of distribution of galaxies. Yes, they're different galaxies, but it sort of looks like this. And it's the same in every direction um, in terms of like the Hubble expansion and what we see, um, whether or not you happen to be here or here or here or here or here or here or here. Um, it just looks the same then um, for all observers. And so that's the cosmological principle there. Um, and so what we're talking about here, though, is this idea that we might live and probably do um, in a universe then that goes on infinitely in every possible direction. Every possible direction. It goes on infinitely in every direction. We just can't see all of it because there hasn't been enough time for that light to get to us. And so um, we're considering then this idea of an infinite universe, so it has no edge. And it has no center because it has no, you can't have a center without an edge. Um, so it has no center, has no edge. It just goes on infinitely then in every direction. It looks to us like we're probably at the center then um, just because there's a limit to how far um, we can see. So, but this idea, we can't be at the center. Yeah, even if we wanted to be because there is no center, because there is no edge. And so that brings up the question then, but if we're not at the center, how does it look like all the objects are moving away from us? And this circles back then on that raisin bread model that we talked about, um, where the, the, the raisin bread expands. Another sort of model that you see then um, all the time is one where they, they have a balloon and they put little sort of markers on it or, or little pieces of tape or paper or something like that. And each of those little bits of, of paper or tape then represents a galaxy and you blow the balloon up and the galaxies then all move away from each other. And, and this is a tough one because the idea is the surface of the balloon itself represents the universe, represents three-dimensional space. Almost like if you're walking around here on the Earth, and to you it looks like the Earth is really just a two-dimensional plane, right? I mean, you've just, you can, I can go north, south, east, west, and I can keep walking in any direction, and I won't hit an end, I won't hit an edge to the Earth, I'll just come back to where I started, even though... As far as I'm concerned, you know, I just kept walking in the same direction. Here I am back again. And thinking about that then is, you know, the surface of the balloon, except that's actually a two-dimensional representation, sort of a three-dimensional space. And at that point, you're going, ah, uh, ah. Uh. But if you just confine yourself to thinking about the surface of the balloon, um... Oh, what was that? Flatland? Yeah, if you've ever read Flatland, think of that. You probably haven't. Um, but, um, but this idea then, imagine yourself like an ant. You can just walk around on the surface of the balloon and you don't know about up and you don't know about down. You only know about right, left, back, forward. And the balloon expands. All of the points on the balloon move further away from each other. And so every point to every point on the balloon, every one of those pieces of tape, every one of those markers, every one of those galaxies, it looks like all the other galaxies then have moved away from you. And you get a Hubble's Law out of this. How I learned it then um, was from a, a sort of a model then of thinking about ants on a ruler. And I'm just going to see if I can draw that because this is good because this actually then um, just pops up, uh, uh, you know, Hubble's Law uh, type expansion just naturally pops out of this. I'll do it slightly different from what's on the screen, of course. Um, but this idea then of imagine, um, I'm just going to call it, well, just points. Ooh, ah, there we go. So we've got A... B, C, D, E, and F. So I've got these, uh, what's that, six points here then, maybe six galaxies, A, B, C, D, E, and F, and maybe they're all separated then by a distance of one meter. All right, this is a tiny universe. Makes you better, happier, think of these then as one megaparsec, something like that. But they're all, nah, I got my thinking about megaparsecs. They're all just one meter apart then. And this is where they start then, at time t equals zero. And say so just over the course of one second, 
the universe expands and all the space then between these galaxies, all the space between these points just doubles over the course of one second. So one second later, oh, I don't want to put it there then. So one second later, I've got galaxy A and now the distance then to galaxy B is two meters because it's doubled. Oh, centimeters, good Lord. Two meters. Now the distance into galaxy C, that's doubled. Now it's two meters. And that doesn't look very good. Oh, there we go. Two meters. The distance to galaxy D has doubled. Two meters. You might want to find that fast forward button. The galaxy to E, now two meters away. And then E to F has also doubled. So now F is two meters. So basically the distance between all the galaxies then has doubled. And this is over the course We'll just make it easy then. This is just over the course of one second. And so at the beginning, maybe look at point C at t equals zero. So we're going to look at point C here then and think about what observers then see on galaxy C. And they're going to look then at t equals zero and they're going to see galaxy D. It's going to be one meter away. So here is C. We're right here on C. I'm going to change colors here. So right here on C, and we're looking back then at B. Yeah, B is one meter away. Excellent. Um, galaxy, that should be a B. Good Lord. Um, galaxy A then, we're here. We're looking towards galaxy A. Galaxy A then, we see that at a distance of two meters away. And looking at C then towards galaxy D. D then also one meter away, looking at galaxy E, that's two meters away, and then finally galaxy F, that's at a distance of three meters away. So I'm sitting around galaxy C then at time t equals zero, I'm looking, I see galaxy F three meters away, I look back in this direction then, I see galaxy B one meter away, galaxy A two meters away, and then boom, we get the, the, the expansion happens, and now at t equals one second, um, we see galaxy B. Again, we're just looking from galaxy C. We see galaxy B then at a distance of two meters. We see galaxy A now at a distance of two and two. We see galaxy A then at a distance of four meters. Looking in the other direction, I see galaxy D has moved to two meters. Galaxy E now is at four meters. And galaxy F then has moved is now at six meters, because it's galaxy F then is two, 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 six meters away then in one second. And so how far, how much did they move in one second? So galaxy B, B moved from one meter to two meters in, uh, in one second, so it's moved one meter in one second. So galaxy B, if I'm sitting on galaxy C and I look at galaxy B, it's like, oh, it just moved one meter in one second. It's moving away from me then at one meter uh, per second. Galaxy A has moved from two meters to four meters, so it's gone two meters in one second. So the observer on galaxy C then sees galaxy A moving away at two meters per second. Galaxy B then moving at one meter per second. Looking in the other direction then, you see galaxy D has gone from one meter to two meters, so it's gone one meter in one second. And galaxy E has gone from two meters to four meters, so it's gone two meters in one second. So I see galaxy D here then moving away from me at one meter per second. I see galaxy E moving away at two meters per second. Galaxy F then has gone from three meters to six meters, so it's moved three meters in one second. And so I see a couple of things to know here then. Whether you look to the right or you look to the left, you see all of those points moving away from you. And the further away those points are, the faster you see them moving away from you. So again, galaxy D is moving away from C at one meter per second. E moving away at two meters per second. F moving away then at three meters per second. So I see then a Hubble's Law type expansion from galaxy C. Well, what then if I look and... I look at one of the other galaxies. Um, I'll look at galaxy D. So looking at D at t equals zero. Um, so here we are now. We're looking at galaxy D at t equals zero, zero. So C then is one meter. I'll just look to the, well, no, I'll look to both sides then. Um, B is at two meters. A then is at three meters away. So here we are in galaxy D. I've got one meter, two meters, three meters. And then looking in the other direction, E, 
is it one meter and f is it two meters one second later then t equals one second galaxy c then we're looking from d galaxy c has moved to two meters so now it's uh two meters away galaxy b then is now four meters away from d galaxy a then is six meters away from galaxy uh, d and e then is two meters away in the opposite direction and f then is four meters away in the opposite direction and this idea then again of how much did they move in one second so c has gone from one meter to two meters so got one meter in one second B has gone from two meters to four meters, so two meters in one second. So B is moving at two meters per second. A then started out at three meters. Now it's at six meters. It's moving at three meters. It's moved three meters in one second. It's moving three meters away. And likewise, then E is moving from one to two, so it's one meter in one second. And two then is moving from two to four, so two meters in one second. It's the same thing. So the person on Galaxy C saw everything moving away from them. The further away they were, the faster they were moving away. Galaxy D then sees the same thing. They see all the other points, all the other galaxies moving away from them. And the further away they are, the faster they're moving away. And so this idea that it's the space itself between the galaxies that's expanding and it's increasing the distances between all the galaxies. So no matter which one you're on, you see the other ones moving away from you, and the further away they are, the faster they're moving away from you. And so um, there's sort of a couple things to, to note, though. Um, the expansion doesn't happen then for things that are nearby, and um, it only happens in the vast emptiness of the space between the galaxies. Here on Earth, gravity is much, much stronger than the expansion of the universe. So it's not like I'm moving away from my computer or you're moving away from wherever you are and that the Earth is getting bigger, the solar system's getting bigger, the Milky Way is getting bigger then. Um, it, it only applies then to the vast open spaces then, um, between, uh, between uh, uh, the galaxies. Um, oh yeah, great, there it is. Um, so yeah, so we don't see things like stars or even galaxies and expanding. Um, and that's because you know this is only happening then over tremendously large scales. And, and even our galaxies then are tiny on the sorts of scales we're, we're talking about with the gravitational, or sorry, with the, the, the expansion of the universe. Okay, so this idea though of the universe having an origin. And um, one way to sort of get at this is to imagine, all right, fine, this is how I see the universe today. Yesterday it was a little bit smaller, or the distances between the galaxies was a little bit less. Things were a little closer together. Day before that, a little closer together, a little bit closer, a little bit closer. Basically thinking about running the clock backwards, or imagining running the movie then of the expansion of the universe backwards. And it's just basically, it's getting the space between the galaxies getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You're packing your universe into a smaller and smaller space, but there's still no center. There's still no edge. There's still no center. A common thing I get was, well, if the universe exploded as an expanding, what's it's expanding into? And, and you can't know. That it's not expanding into anything. It's just space itself is getting bigger. And, and that's because we're stuck in this three-dimensional universe where I blow up that, that balloon and that balloon gets bigger as it expands into the room. And, and that's, that's not what's going on here then. But this idea then of just running the model backwards and thinking about then, well, if you run it backwards then, um, it's basically you're, you're starting to talk about higher and higher densities and higher and higher temperatures as you run the run the, the sort of movie backwards then and and thinking about then the universe at its very very beginning as being everything crammed into a very very small space very high temperatures very high densities which then started expanding and so this is referred to as the Big Bang model of the universe and um, it's it's bad. I don't like the the, the Big Bang thing um, because it implies in some type of explosion. People think that, oh, the universe exploded. And it's really just a, an expansion then of the space 
in our universe that, that just began expanding then and, and it sort of yeah allowed us to, to reach the, the state we find uh, the universe in um, today. And, and this idea then of just imagine, imagine running in running in good uh, running the clock backwards and thinking then you know things packed smaller and smaller everything sort of squeezed in closer and closer together in a smaller space would of course with all that energy um high temperatures and all of that mass in that small space at high densities and then thinking about then you know at some point um the space itself then uh started expanding and why do we think that happened i mean um, there, there must be something, I mean, so it's, it's not like a bunch of astronomers got together and said, eh, yeah, here we go. Big bang. Oh, I like that. Let's go with that. Oh. <laughs> it's based on evidence and it's based on observations. It's based on ideas, things that we see that suggest this is what happened and suggest then that this is what's going on, um, in the universe today. And so why do we think there was a Big Bang? Or why do we think, um, maybe I should even stop saying Big Bang. Why do we think we live in a universe then where space itself is doing this wild expansion? And of course, um, you know, idea number one is the whole idea, the Hubble constant and Hubble's law. And this idea of, well, when I go out and I look at distant galaxies in any direction, the further away they are, the faster they're moving away from us. And you really sort of have two choices with that, two sort of explanations. One is that the Milky Way is weird and we're at the center of something that's causing these gal other galaxies then to all move away from us. We're in some special place in the universe where we just happen to have this magical view. And if they were, on, if you were on one of these other galaxies, then you'd see, um, you know, how do we, how do we want to say this? You'd see everybody sort of moving um, quite differently than what we would see here um, on the Earth, in our galaxy. If everything was sort of moving away from us, one of these moving away galaxies here would see um, nothing moving in this direction and then everything moving in this direction. We would be occupying a special place. Uh, or you just say, well, the universe, the space in the universe is expanding, carrying the galaxies with us. Boom, you've got a Hubble's law. And it's isotropic and we're not in a special place. And it just makes a, a lot more sense. But that's not the only sort of evidence. That's not the only thing that has led people to think about this Big Bang or this expansion going on. And another idea then is the CMB, the Cosmic Microwave Background. And it's, it's believed to be pretty direct evidence then um, of the Big Bang, or at least the idea that the universe was much hotter and more denser, good, more denser, good Lord, and denser than, um, you can tell, it's the end of the semester, um, much denser than, than what we're seeing now. And this is a, this is a, interesting sort of piece of history then. Um, this was actually discovered by the phone company. Um, the, the echoes of the Big Bang in the, the, the sky, the whole thing, idea that AT&T found it or Bell Labs found it. But this was 1964 then. Um, two sort of radio electronics antenna experts then who worked at Bell Labs and Arlo Penzias and Robert Wilson then. They were working on an antenna then um, that would basically pick up signals off what were called echo balloon satellites. And these were passive communication satellites. The idea was I could take like a, almost like a, a, a weather balloon then and cover it with a shiny re reflective in the radio sort of metal paint and put this up way, 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 way high up. And I could take radio signals then and bounce it off that balloon and, and to, to someplace else. And so I could just bounce my radio signal off this balloon and they would get these radio signals very, very far away. And it's a lot cheaper and easier than, than some active satellite that has to have a radio receiver and a transmitter on it then to take your, your incoming radio with a transmission then and take it and go, oh yeah, okay. And then broadcast it then, um, towards the new location. And these would be way, 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 way cheaper and easier to make and just all sorts of better then. Um, so but in order for this to work, then you needed super sensitive radio antennas. And that's what they were doing then. They were trying to make us an insanely sensitive um, radio uh, antenna then. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. Um, that, that would um, 
that would pick up because you're bouncing a radio signal off a balloon. This is going to be a faint signal. So you had a super, um, super sensitive uh, radio or uh, radio receivers, and that's that's actually the receiver behind him. Then it's a microwave receiver on the radio wave. Sort of would come in here, bounce off this wall, and down into a detector um, that's right behind this guy's head. Um, Okay, so but they built this thing, and and it was you know big big receiver then, and they had problems with it though because they would get this they, they had this signal that they were getting that was a hundred times stronger than what they were expecting, and they thought um, it was a problem with the equipment because no matter where they pointed that radio receiver, no matter where they pointed that antenna, they got the same signal, and so that implies then that it's not the Sun or Cygnus X1 or some, you know, galactic radio source, something like that. It's the same in every direction. And it's remarkably uniform. It's the same exact signal in every direction. And um, they, they saw it then, no matter what direction they looked, um, it was the same thing. And they, they hunted and they worked and they worked and, and tried to find then um, what the source of this was. Um, and and usually, yeah, usually when this happens, it's an equipment problem. And so they went and they checked everything they could possibly, could possibly be causing um, this signal. They even um, found a, a pigeon um, that had been living in the antenna and they, they trapped the pigeon and let it go and they cleaned up all the pigeon poop um, that it had left in the antenna and they had nothing. And no matter what they did to try and get this to work, they always had this noise here. And it turned out then that this had actually been predicted by people just up the street then um, at, uh, I believe it was Princeton. This was all in New Jersey. Um, I think it was Princeton then that, that the people who worried about cosmology and the, the formation of the, the universe and the whole Big Bang then, um, they'd actually predicted this signal and were in the process of building their own telescope, super sensitive radio telescope to detect it. Uh, they'd already predicted this. And so, yeah, uh, they won the Nobel Prize in 1978 then for this discovery of basically what they were seeing then was an echo from the Big Bang. And that's why it was the same in every direction because of this idea then of you know the, the observable universe that we can see as sort of a sphere that surrounds us and this whole idea of isotropy then, it should be the same in no matter what direction we look then. And so this idea, a lot of science is just happens by people um, just running into something that they weren't expecting. This is sort of like a perfect example of that. Um, and, um, all right, so this idea then is what, we're, what they were seeing then were microwaves. And this is a plot then of wavelength versus intensity. And you'll notice it looks an awful lot like a black body curve. And indeed it is. And it corresponds to a black body of a temperature of 2.725 uh, degrees Kelvin. So basically 2.7 or sometimes people just call it the three degree uh, microwave radiation. And... And so this is basically then a, a signal then um, left over from, from the Big Bang, or it turns out a little shortly after the Big Bang, um, this signal. And again, it's incredibly uniform. You see it in no matter what direction you look. And so, but, but what's going on here though? I mean, this whole idea was shortly after the Big Bang. I just said it, said it moments ago, this idea of the early universe being dense and hot. And so, so what's up with this? 2.7 Kelvin is not hot. That's like almost absolute zero. That's almost as cold as you can get. And so, but the idea though is, wait a minute, this was emitted a really, really long time ago, or it's coming from very, very far away, and there's going to be a redshift because of the expansion of the universe. And so this was probably when it was first emitted, radiation that corresponded to a much higher temperature, that peak was at a much shorter wavelength, and it's just been redshifted by the expansion of the universe um, on its way to us. And so we see it as something cool, even though it was emitted then when it was much, 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 much um, hotter. And so this idea, it turns out, this was the prediction, and, and then the neat thing about this was this was actually predicted before Penzias and Wilson actually found it. Um, the, the cosmologists then had been working for years on this idea and had gotten to the point where they were sure enough that it could be found that they were building a radio telescope to find it. It's just Penzias and Wilson then working for the phone company. They saw the signal first. 
Um, and so, but this is coming then from a time when the universe and this light, these photons, this radiation, coming to us from a point where the universe was only about 300,000 years old. And um, the, why 300,000? What's special about that? And the idea is before 300,000 years old, the universe was hot, and it was so hot then that the hydrogen was completely ionized. You didn't, and going back, well, I'll circle back around on this, but the idea of a universe at that point being mostly hydrogen, a little bit of helium, maybe trace amounts of lithium then, but, you know, dominated by hydrogen. And we think about the hydrogen today, we tend to see it then at these much, much cooler temperatures then with the proton and the electron going around and it's neutral hydrogen. But, you know, 300,000 years after the Big Bang, it's going to be super, super hot and the, the hydrogen and the complete completely ionized. So you had then basically naked protons, naked hydrogen nuclei, and free electrons then floating around. And the trouble is, though, this, this, this light will interact then with the protons um, of the hydrogen. If it doesn't have an electron going around, it'll also, the light will also then scatter um, off the electrons as well. So the problem was that um, before that point, I've gotten ahead of myself in the slides a little bit, but the high hydrogen ionized hydrogen is opaque, or the light scatters off it really, really easy. And so you might have a photon on its way towards you, but if you've got this ionized hydrogen between you and that light, it's going to end up interacting with the hydrogen and being sent off in some other direction. We talked a little bit about this in the case of helium, and ionized helium causing, well, I'm going to say opacity issues or causing then a blocking of light with our pulsating uh, variable stars. Remember that? This is the same sort of thing with all that hydrogen ionized that the light really can't travel very far before it gets interacted with. So it's like the universe is just like a fog while that hydrogen was still ionized. But by about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe is expanding, or I should say the space that makes up the universe is expanding. All the matter is sort of moving, a, moving apart, having a little more wiggle room, cooling off. It hit about 3,000 Kelvin, and the, it, was, it was cool enough then for the hydrogen and uh, protons, the nuclei then, and the electrons then to recombine and not get kicked off. I mean, part of the problem when it gets really hot is you've got hydrogen and an electron going around it, you get a collision, you end up knocking the hydrogen or knocking the electron off the hydrogen atom. But by the time you get down to about 3000 Kelvin, then it's cool enough for the hydrogen and uh, protons and the, the electrons then to stick together. And at that point, they don't get knocked apart. And at that point, they stop messing with the light because the light's no longer scattering then off the free protons. The light has to have the exact wavelength that the electron around that hydrogen atom can absorb. Um, the whole spectrum thing then, the whole jump dance of the electrons. So, that, so now those hydrogen atoms can only mess with very, certain very, very specific wavelengths of light. And at that point then, the universe becomes transparent. And those, those the, the photons then, unless they're the totally wrong energy uh, to, for the electron to absorb them, then those photons then can go right past the hydrogen. And so we talk about this as the era of recombination. And the hydrogen then becomes transparent, and all of a sudden light can travel great distances in our universe. And so what that means, though, is the light that was emitted back in that time of recombination, some of those photons are still haven't been interacted with. They were they, you know, under, underwent that last interaction uh, 300,000 years after the Big Bang, that last bounce off one of these ionized hydrogen nuclei then, and off they go, and nothing's messed with them since until they, they reach the Earth and we, we observe them then. Um, so, and the idea though was all of these photons and the universe hits 3000 Kelvin then, all of a sudden the light can go anywhere it wants, it becomes transparent. The light that we see then from that era just at recombination, just when the light universe became transparent and the light could get around, um, should correspond to a blank body then with a temperature of about 3,000 degrees Kelvin, because that was the temperature of the matter the light last interacted with. And, and um, anything warmer than that, prior to that then, they were bounced around by that opaque gas. And so this whole time then, the universe, they, basically a 3,000 Kelvin black body, all of this radiation being emitted, and but by the time they reach us, they've been redshifted, and so that 3,000 Kelvin black body, the radiation we'd expect from a 3,000 Kelvin black body, it's all been shifted into the red by the expansion of the universe. So what we see today then um, was 
our photons then with a with correspond to a black body of about 2.7 um, Kelvin. And it's a it's a weird idea though that the photons you're detecting with the, those microwave telescopes, the cosmic microwave background, those photons then have been traveling towards us then since the universe was 300,000 years old, and they haven't been interacted with um, since. And so the, here's a horrible drawing um, trying to sort of show, you know, here's the universe at an age, oh, where'd my cursor go? Okay, back here. There we go. At an age then of about 300,000 years, the universe is transparent or opaque at this point. The photons are just sort of bouncing around, and then the universe becomes transparent, and any interaction then, just as the universe becomes transparent, those photons then basically just continue to travel, and some of them aren't going to get messed with at all, and they've just been on their way towards us then um, since that point. And as the universe expands then, those photons, the wavelengths then, are getting longer and longer and longer as the universe um, expands. So what we see here on Earth as we observe the universe, given that it has this age to it, um, what we see is sort of something like this, where the edge of the observable universe to us then corresponds to the three degree uh, microwave background. Anything prior to this, anything outside here then is either uh, way out here too far away, the light hasn't gotten to us, but even stuff then from like 200,000 years after the Big Bang, um, we don't see that light because the universe was opaque. The universe was a fog at that point, and the photons that were created here just get bounced around and we never end up um, seeing them. So it's almost like sitting here on the Earth and you look and there's just this wall of radiation then that corresponds to a 2.7 Kelvin uh, uh, black body then um, that just surrounds us. And it's remarkable then how uniform that background is. No matter what direction you point, you see the exact same temperature. Um, so thinking about that though, the existence of this microwave radiation is completely consistent with the idea of an expanding, cooling universe. It's completely consistent with the idea of the Big Bang and is one of the, the greatest sort of you know, the best evidence we have, in addition to the Hubble expansion, that this is what really happened. And um, I, it's, it's weird stuff, but nonetheless. Um, and you can say, okay, well, well, if we can't see it, then what happened uh, in that first 300,000 years then that, that, we can't, um, that we can't observe? And that gets tricky, and you've got to basically just go back and try... Um, and, and figure it out based on theory, based on understanding how you think things should work, and, and sort of thinking about what must it have been like then. And, and sort of the, these timescales here are insane, insanely short, because all of this happened in a very, very short time. time. But you've got then sort of a, a breakdown at the very, very beginning then. Um, You've got the universe is extraordinarily small, everything packed into this very, very small uh, space, or I should say everything scrunched up together. Space itself is small, might be a better way to say it then. And insanely high temperatures of more than a trillion uh, Kelvin. And at that point then, you've got, you know, when you think about the corresponding photons, the, the radiation that corresponds to those kinds of temperatures, and yeah, these are gamma rays, seriously high energy gamma rays. But you've got the gamma rays, the photons, and colliding with each other, bouncing off each other. And remember, though, that a trillion Kelvin is a tremendous amount of energy, and energy and mass are the same thing, E equals mc squared. So from these high energies then, you can have uh, gamma rays, high energy gamma rays colliding, and sometimes producing then um, matter from that reaction. And you'll get then matter produced as a proton and an antiproton, or a neutron and an antineutron, and that's matter and antimatter, and they'll see each other and then recombine and turn back into gamma ray photons, turn back into energy. Um, but at that time, you had enough energy then for um, gamma rays to convert into fairly massive particles then, like, like uh, protons and antiprotons then. Um, and, and, and this process then, where, where they would just sort of, you know, the, they would collide, the photons would collide, you'd get this matter and antimatter produced, they'd, they'd recombine then back into energy. But it, it, yeah, so... Um, how do we want to say it? Um, so, so, but these were massive particles then. And what is weird here, though, is, is to think, 
well, wait a minute then, if you've got energy and you convert it then from energy to matter, you get matter and antimatter that are created, and yeah, they probably see each other then, the, the particles then, got a proton with a positive charge, an antiproton with a negative charge, you're going to go back together and re-annihilate each other. But for reasons we really don't understand, for about every billion proton-antiproton pairs that were produced and annihilated each other, one proton then, for about every billion of them, one proton ended up surviving. And this is why then we find matter in our universe. And whether it's matter or antimatter doesn't matter. If we lived in an antimatter universe, we'd call it a matter universe just because it's what we've got around us. So, so But this idea that we exist in a universe with matter is, is a very, very curious idea then, or a very, very curious thing that we're not entirely sure what was going on with that then. But not all of the matter, uh, antimatter pairs, um, not all of the matter then ended up annihilating. Maybe I'll say it like that, with its antimatter counterpart. For some reason, just a tiniest bit more regular matter was produced um, than antimatter. And then by the time you get down to about, what is that, one ten thousandth of a second then, um, the temperature had dropped to the point that the colliding photons don't have enough energy then to make uh, protons and antiprotons, neutrons and antineutrons. You can only make less massive particles because as the temperature drops, the energy drops, and the, the mass you can make or convert then back and forth energy to, to mass and becomes lower and lower and lower. And by this point then, um, the, the, the photons and the gamma rays, you only have enough energy to make electron-positron uh, pairs. But in the same sort of process then, just a few more electrons ended up being made as opposed to antimatter electrons. So we end up then with a universe, as it's cooling off, you can only make less and less massive particles as it continues to cool with the e equals mc squared. You get a few protons that were created, you get a few electrons that were created, and at some point then it gets so cool then that you can't even make electrons anymore. And at that point, of the matter that you've made is the matter that you've got to work with in the universe. The, the universe is no longer has enough energy in the gamma rays to convert some of those in, into the equivalent mass. And so the matter that you've got, basically protons, neutrons, and electrons then, um, they've all been formed. And again though, by one minute, the temperatures are still pretty hot. You're talking about then, what is that, 10 billion degrees Kelvin. Um, and you've got then the protons and neutrons can start fusing and form deuterium. Remember that's also part of the proton-proton chain. That's basically a proton and a neutron stuck together. And then uh, over the course of two minutes then, you can start sticking deuterium uh, together to make helium. It's basically running essentially along the lines of the proton-proton uh, process. And you're basically then building up heavier and heavier elements then by sticking them together. And, but at the same time, as you're making these heavier and heavier elements, then the temperature in the universe then is dropping as space continues to expand and the temperatures drop. And so you can make some helium and maybe you can make a little bit of lithium, but by the time three minutes is up, um, you've hit a, you hit a billion Kelvin and most of the nuclear reactions then um, most of the nuclear reactions have stopped, and they fully stop then after about 30 minutes. And so it's this idea, you start off then with protons and neutrons, and you start putting uh, stuff together, and I can make some deuterium then, and I can stick the deuterium together, and I can make helium, and I can stick a couple, a little bit more deuterium then on that helium, maybe I can make lithium, and the whole time those reactions are running those, your temperatures are dropping lower and lower and lower, the collisions are getting weaker and weaker and weaker, and you run into a point then where you just can't do any nuclear reactions anymore. And so we think then in that process, um, we've got a universe then where 75% is just left over in the form of hydrogen nuclei. And at this point though, the temperatures were still earlier than that 300,000 years. The temperatures are still so high that the electrons and protons of that hydrogen haven't combined. Well, you've got then 75% in the form then of hydrogen nuclei, maybe 24% in the form of helium, and then trace then um, amounts of lithium. And you never had enough time then um, to get to, to make anything heavier than lithium, like beryllium here. Um, and so, but, but that's sort of the basic idea. You've got then a universe then that only, it was only hot enough then to form helium, a little bit of lithium before things cooled off. And everything heavier then that you see 
was made inside the, the cores then, or inside the shells then, uh, of stars. And these first stars that formed out of this mixture then, being mostly hydrogen and a little bit of helium then, um, being very, very, very massive stars, very short-lived stars. And it, it's an interesting idea, but they talk about um, You've got this process then at 300,000 years where the, uh, the universe then becomes transparent to, to radiation. You've got these massive stars then that form that are tremendously hot, a tremendous amount of high energy light then that actually reionize re the universe for a little bit um, and they, just for a short period of time. And then um, everything sort of... Uh, goes back then, um, you have then a recombination, then a second recombination event then um, after that. But that's sort of the basic idea of what we think was happening then in the early parts um, of the universe. And it's fun to think about sort of the implications for all this though, um, that the universe then, because it's not empty, because it has matter in it, that matter then pulls on space-time, and that the universe itself then has um, a, a curvature to its space. And you can think about three different kinds of curvature. And one is a positive curvature, where, and this is tough because we're talking about three-dimensional space then sort of curving into a fourth dimension. Ah, and you go, ah. Um, but, but this idea, you know, the, talk about this idea of positive curvature where there's enough gravity in the universe to pull the universe um, back in on itself. And you talk about positive curvature then, this is a closed universe where... How do we want to say this? It, it's closed, meaning I can sit here and I can go off in some direction and I'm not going to reach the end of the universe, but I'm going to come back to where I started, sort of like the surface of the balloon or the surface of the earth. If I start walking north and I keep walking north, then I can you know, get across the water and stuff. I'm going to come back to where I started, even though I never hit a wall or anything like that. Another possibility, though, is that there is no curvature to the universe. It's basically a flat universe. And, and so it's, it's infinite, and we talk about that then as an open universe. Maybe the difference between closed universe is a positively curved universe that's closed actually has enough gravity in it then for the enough mass for the gravity to pull that universe back together again. It'll, you know, some initial Big Bang explosion and it's, pull, it's basically expanding, but there's enough mass, enough gravity then to pull that universe sort of back together. And that would be the situation for a closed universe. An open universe then, basically, there's, there's, um, how do we want to say it? There's no curvature to it. It goes off in every possible direction, and it's infinite, and it will continue to expand forever. And yes, there's matter in it, but um, the matter will slow the expansion of the universe down, but it will never actually stop it. It's sort of like, oh, I'm going to go this far, and then I'll go half that distance, and then a quarter of that distance, and then an eighth of that distance. And sure, you're still moving forward um, every little bit, but you're effectively, how do we want to say it? You know, you're, you're always moving forward, but, but you're never quite stopping. Uh, something like that. But the universe then where the expansion, basically, here we go. The universe where the expansion then eventually stops, but it takes an infinite amount of time for that to happen. Oh. And then the third possibility is referred to as negative curvature. And that's where space actually sort of curves away from itself. Or looking at space... It expands uh, basically in front of you. The space in front of you then gets larger and larger and larger. And so that's another example of an infinite open universe where you can head off in any direction and you will never come back to where you started. And it will also then continue to expand forever. And it won't stop. It will always be expanding. And so you can think about tests to figure out what sort of universe you're in. Um, it's just a fun slide. Um, but you can imagine being some alien and just sort of shooting some lasers in one direction. And in an open or a flat universe, then it's infinite. That light will just, those lasers will just go on forever. In a closed universe, then, but that light then will come back around and hit you. Even though the light has always been going straight, the curvature of the universe, it's curved back in on itself then, and that light then will, uh, will hit you. And all of this then depends on how much mass, how much gravity there is in the universe. And you can't really talk about how much mass there is in the universe if the mass is infinite. Oh, but what you can talk about is the density of mass in the universe. And this idea then that there is some critical density past which, you know, if you have more mass in the universe, if you have a greater density than the critical density, then that's enough to slow the expansion, to stop the expansion, and pull the universe back in, in on itself then. 
And people talk about this idea of an oscillating universe where you get then basically an expansion of space, a big bang, there's enough mass in the universe though, enough gravity to stop that expansion, pull it back together again, and you have that basically the big crunch where it all comes back together again, and then maybe another big bang, and this universe then that continues to expand and contract and expand and contract, as opposed to if there's not enough density, not enough mass in the universe to stop the expansion, It'll either be a flat space or a hyperbolic space, and the universe then will just continue um, to expand forever. If you go out and look around then, um, what you see in terms of mass that we can detect, luminous mass, stars, galaxies, planets, stuff like that, then we're about 10% the critical density. Um, but, we, but don't forget, though, there's also that dark matter out there. And as near as we can tell, the amount of dark matter out there is just the right amount of matter, then, to, to make the universe flat. And this idea, then, that you know, we're in a flat universe, then, that it's just equal to the critical density, then, and the universe, then, the expansion will actually stop over time and contract itself. Or at least that's what I said maybe about 15 years ago. That might be about right. Um, because it turns out um, that that's not quite the case. Yes, space, as we look around, appears very, very flat. But it also, though, looks like, um, if you look at the Type 1a supernova in these distant galaxies, it actually looks like the expansion is picking up speed. And this is why um, you know, those Type 1a supernova are so super important then as standard uh, standard candles. And the idea then is, oh gosh, what would cause the universe then to actually accelerate? And, and this is really important then because that's, in order for the universe to be picking up speed, we've got the gravity in the universe that's trying to slow it down, that's pulling it together. You've got to have something then that's pushing back against gravity, this idea of a fifth force or some sort of springiness or some sort of repulsiveness to space that's pushing back against the gravity. That has to be out there in order for the universe then um, to be accelerating. And so you'll hear people talk about what they, what they call dark energy or uh, this idea that there's a false vacuum associated with space, that empty space, even though there's no matter in it, even though it's a vacuum, there is an energy associated with that then that gives that space a springiness to, to push back against gravity. Oh, where have I talked about this? Oh, yeah, Einstein's cosmological constant that he put in the field equations from general relativity to counteract gravity, um, it turns out, even though he did it and just did it to get a static universe, and the minute he saw, shortly after he saw Hubble's work, he was like, oh, the universe, it's not static. I should never put the cosmological constant in there. Einstein talked about that as his greatest mistake. Um, it turns out he might have been on the right track to begin with, though, this idea of a springiness to space. And so here's sort of what you see with the data, and these are plots then where they're just plotting um, the brightness of a supernova, or I should say, yeah, the, the brightness then of these, uh, these type 1a supernova then in magnitudes. These are just apparent brightnesses, how bright they're appearing. But remember, these are type 1a supernova then, so they should have the same luminosity. And so if you just plot their brightness then, you're really plotting their distance, because the further away they are, the fainter they're going to look, or the bigger their magnitude is going to be. Oh, the bigger their apparent magnitude. Um, this is a plot then of... Um, Basically, how big is the redshift? And so here then is a redshift that's half the speed of light. Here's a redshift then that is uh, basically equal to the speed of light. And at that point, you have to start worrying about relativity, special relativity, and you can correct for that. But here's sort of an idea then of the scale of the universe compared to what it is today. And so here then would be a scale of the universe that points, let's see, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, that'd be about 90% the size of what we see today, 80%, 70%. So back here, the universe is only about half the size it is today. And what they've got plotted here then, um, the pink stuff is where the brightnesses then we would see these supernova if the the universe then was basically slowing down in its expansion the blue stuff is where we would see these supernova then if the universe was accelerating in it in, in its expansion and here they've got basically different lines this is with a vacuum energy associated with space this is without a vacuum energy associated with space this is basically this line here then is the critical density here then is a basically a closed universe here's an open 
open universe. And the thing is, though, if you look at these supernova, and here um, you're looking, maybe here it's sort of blown up a little bit. If you look at these supernova, then they're for the most part uh, on the blue side here with the accelerating universe then. And this idea, if I go out and look at these supernova, and, well, gosh, um, their brightness here, for their redshift, these supernova then are, uh, so this is a plot then, sorry, I'm getting messed up because they, they messed up the y-axis here then. But here we go. So this is the brightness, and they're getting fainter and fainter as you go up, right? Because this is magnitudes. And this is the distance. And so this idea, if I look at a distance, if, at, at a redshift then of half the speed of light in a universe then where it was not accelerating or decelerating then, I would expect to see the supernova brightness. I would expect to see them right here. But I see these supernova then at larger apparent magnitudes than I should for their redshift. Larger apparent magnitudes, because they all have the same luminosity, means they're further away than they should be. They're further away than they should be. That means that the they're further away that the universe has picked up speed, that the expansion has picked up speed, that the, the acceleration of the universe then um, is expanding. And so this idea then that there's this dark energy out here, there's something that's causing the acceleration um, of our universe uh, to actually pick up speed. And they call it dark energy then um, because we don't see it in starlight, we don't see it in the cosmic microwave background, we don't see it interacting then with light sources, with other galaxies, things like that. It's, it's out there, but again, we don't really know um, what this dark energy is. And there are all sorts of ideas behind it, but, but nobody's quite sure. Different exotic particles might cause it. Um, it may be something with the structure of space and time itself. There's a Nobel Prize out there waiting for somebody, uh, but it's out there. All right, so... Universe accelerating. One last thing I want to talk about. This is different from when you'll hear people talk about the idea of inflation. And there are a couple of problems then um, that, um, that you see. And one is if you go out and you look then at the cosmic microwave background, um, it looks like what you would have coming from a flat space. If the universe had a positive curve or a negative curve to it, then we'd see um, we'd see a less flat cos uh, cosmic microwave background. It, it looks very, very flat. As near as we can tell, um, the universe is flat to at least within a few percent. And that's, that's a weird sort of situation to have then, um, where the universe is just flat to, to within a few percent. I mean, how do you how do you get that lucky where we happen to be in a universe then where the matter plus the dark matter makes the universe look um, almost uh, almost entirely uh, uh, flat? You have an even worse problem with that though with the horizon problem. And if you think about you know down here, this is uh, the the sort of image from uh, the one of the. Uh, microwave satellites then that map the cosmic microwave background, that 2.7 Kelvin background, it looks identical almost to like into the millikelvin range in this direction as it does in that direction. But the problem is, how does the, how does the microwave background in this direction, 2.7 Kelvin, how does it know to be the exact same 2.7 uh, Kelvin in this direction? If I think about it, this is as far to, as I can see in this direction. This is as far as I can see in this direction. Wait a minute, though. If I'm thinking, I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing, how did these two points, you know, the light from this point right here just reach me after 3.8 3 billion years, minus 300,000 years. And the light from this side then just reached me after 3.8 billion years. Wait a minute, then the light from this this part has not reached. The, these two points were never in contact with each other. I mean, the light is just reaching to me now from that point, and just reaching to me now in that point. They, the light from that point hasn't gotten to that other point. They, they've never been in contact with each other. So how do they know to look so similar to each other? And there's an even third problem um, that we have, and that's if you go back and look at. Um, the whole idea of the Big Bang and the extraordinary temperatures. And um, there's this idea that the forces that we see today, at least the electromagnetic force, the strong force, and the weak nuclear force, really are the same force. 
and they just look different than um, at lower temperatures that we see, we see the actual universe in today with these lower temperatures, and that as the, the universe cooled off, these three forces sort of broke away and looked different today, but at the time, they were really were the same force, this idea then of, of uh, a, a unified uh, force. And if you get bored, you can look up this idea of unification and grand unification, that the four fundamental forces we see today, three of them really are the same force. And we think, we think you can, that that's actually electromagnetic and the weak force actually have been unified. And so if you talk to some people who do this for a living, then they talk about the electro weak force and that the weak nuclear force and the electromagnetic force really are the same force. We just see them differently, just like electricity and magnetism. You don't think of them as the same force and yet they really, really are, even though they behave so differently on your desktop. Um, anyway, so I've totally digressed. Um, back then, though, when the universe was much, much hotter then, um, you should also then have um, sort of massive stable particles that should have been part of this then. And the big one is the magnetic monopole. Back when the universe was that small and that hot then, um, in the breaking off of the forces, you should have had magnetic monopoles, um, lots of them um, being produced. And you look around today, though, and you don't see any magnetic monopoles. And and so, oh, probably more than we want to get into. But if you think about a normal magnet, it's got a north and a south pole, right? And if you take that magnet and you break it in half, don't do it. But if you break that magnet in half, you end up with two bits of a magnet, each with a north and a south pole. Poles on magnets always come in pairing. You will never see a magnet with just a north pole. There will always be a south pole to that magnet. And magnetic monopoles, though, um, if they did exist, that would be the case, where you just could have a north magnetic pole or a south magnetic pole. But those, those have never been shown to exist, to be possible in our universe. And the problem then is, where are they? And all of this comes back to this idea of inflation. And, and this idea then that the universe then started uh, very, very, very small and um, that there was this period though where the universe went under this tremendous expansion. And the universe, you know, back then was very, very small and, and everything was all crowded in in a very, very small space. And so what we see today then as, you know, this end of the universe and that end of the universe and they're too far away to talk to each other, that wasn't the case before um, this inflation. And so um, basically for about 10 to the 9, negative 36 seconds then after the Big Bang um, to some time between 10 to the negative 33 and 10 to the negative 30 second section, seconds then somewhere in there, there was a tremendous inflation then uh, that took place in the universe. And um, faster than the speed of light. And you go, wait a minute, you can't break the speed of light. And you go, yes, you can. The, the whole relativity says matter can't travel faster than the speed of light. Empty space can. Empty space can expand faster than the speed of light because there's nothing expanding except space. And at that point you go, oh, I'm not going to sleep tonight. Um, but this, this basic idea that there was this tremendous period of, of faster than light expansion. So when we look today and we say, well, these two parts of the sky have never been able to communicate. Why are they both 2.7 degrees Kelvin? back before inflation they were. It also will smooth out any irregularities then in the, the, the sort of cosmic microwave background in the, in the, in the cosmic microwave background. It'll, it'll basically, in this tremendous expansion, those, those exotic particles like monopoles, like magnetic monopoles, will get all spread out. And so they become extraordinary, extraordinarily rare. And because of that tremendous expansion, you end up with a universe then that looks very, very flat um, because, of, because of this inflation. Um, and so, yes, through WMAP um, and looking at the cosmic microwave background, we are really, 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 really sure um, inflation happened. And if, and if that's the case, the universe we're living in today is, is basically flat. Space itself is flat. It's accelerating, though. The expansion is accelerating. It's going to expand forever. And the universe we live in then, about 4.6% of it then, is normal matter, like the stuff my desk and, and me is made out of. About 23% of it is dark matter. And then there's, there's another 72% of the universe then that's in the form of this dark energy that's driving the acceleration. Then we have no idea what it is. And so um, I hate ending um, on a 
uh, saying we have no idea what it is, but you know, welcome to astronomy. This is this is all a work in progress. And if this interests you, um, think about going on in astronomy. It's a fascinating, fascinating field. Um, there, there's lots of books out there you can read about this. Um, and yeah, try not to stay up late trying to trying to trying to sort all this. It, it gets weird um, when you start talking about the Big Bang and stuff. All right, so I want to finish, though, because I remembered this time just to knock off a couple of questions that um, maybe after this lecture you all know the answer to. We've got uh, Obler's paradox that the night sky is dark implies, and so the universe must be filled with dark matter, the universe must have an edge, the universe does not have enough mass to stop its expansion, or the distant galaxies must be further than um, Hub the Hubble law predicts. All right, so the universe must be filled with dark matter? No, because remember dark matter, we call it dark matter because it doesn't interact with light. We can't see it. It's not going to make things dark. Um, the universe does not have a ma enough mass to stop its expansion, although that's true. That's not why the night sky is dark. Um, the distant galaxies must be further than Hubble's law predicts. That's now uh, um, I'm going for this idea that the universe has um, a finite age. Um, Type 1a, oh, I should have put an a in here, though, but type 1a supernova in distant galaxies appear fainter than we expect at the present rate of expansion. And, of course, um, if the universe is slowing down, they wouldn't be further away than we expect. Um, there's enough matter in the universe for it to be a closed universe. Uh, that's actually clearly not true. Uh, there must be large clouds of dust and gas blocking our view in many directions. No. Um, and, of course, I'm looking for this idea that the universe, its expansion is accelerating because these distant galaxies are further away um, than they should be. All right, so the voids between superclusters of galaxies are best described. Hey, wait a minute. This is, might be a previous chapter question. Anyways, uh, but here we go. Um, how do you describe, then, the filament structure of the universe on large scales, those voids? And you've got large regions filled with nothing but dark matter, large regions, regions filled with many very dim galaxies, large reason, regions mostly empty of visible matter, or there are probably some dim low-mass galaxies within them, and large regions of intergalactic dust which block light from distant galaxies. Okay, no, it's not it's not dust blocking light. These are actually voids between superclusters. This idea of a filament structure. And remember what we talked about with this idea of the dark matter clumping up shortly before or shortly after the, the formation of the universe and then the visible matter following the dark matter so that the, the, the dark matter probably is in these filament shapes and it's pulled the, the light matter then to it. Um, so no, it probably wouldn't then be A either. Come on, where'd my cursor go? Um, and so very dim, filled with very dim galaxies, then they wouldn't really be voids. So I'm going to go, yeah, they're large regions of mostly empty space, um, at least in terms of visible matter. But yeah, there might be a few things in there that we haven't seen. Hubble's law is an example of what principle? Oh, okay. We've got the universe is homogeneous, the universe is isotropic, the cosmological constant, all of the above. All right, so Einstein's cosmological constant is not a principle. It's that thing he added to give a springiness to space to fight back against gravity. So it can't be C, and the minute you know it can't be C, it can't be D. So it's either the universe is homogeneous or isotropic. And homogeneous just means the distribution is uniform, and isotropic means it looks the same in every direction. I see the same thing in every direction. So homogeneous just means, you know, everything is spread out the same. This looks no different from that, looks no different from that. Isotro isotropic means I see the same thing in every direction. And sure enough, with Hubble's law, I see Hubble's law, I see galaxies in every direction uh, moving away from me. So the answer for that one is isotropic. All right, so that brings it to a close. I think this was longer than I wanted it to be, um, but we're done. Woohoo! And uh, I'll have office hours, and let me know if you have any questions.